Uh, hello and good evening. Welcome to our webinar. We're talking about milk vending machines tonight and I'm joined by Suffolk dairy farmer Johnny Crickmore. My name's Shirley Macmillan and I'll be uh, getting some information out of Johnny about his experience of selling his own raw milk at the family farm in Suffolk. And uh, just before we um, get into the nitty gritties of it all, we've got a, a bit of an overview here. So I'll go through a few housekeeping slides about how we operate this go to webinar. We'll have a quick overview of the Fen Farm dairy and then we'll get really into the meaty stuff, which is Johnny's journey in selling raw milk direct to the public, how he developed his uh, milk vending machine business and a bit on what he's done today and then a bit of a next steps from AHDB. So in terms of housekeeping, we do have all attendees muted to avoid having background noise. We'll be finishing promptly at eight o'clock and this webinar will be recorded so you can log on after the event. But we would really like you to please complete the survey at the end, which will help us to improve our future webinars that are coming up. And if you would like to ask a question, it will be anonymous. Uh, so please be brave and find out what you can from Johnny while you can. You click on the arrow in the orange box and it shows the control panel and uh, you can see there uh, how to do it with the questions. Click the white arrow to open the questions box, type your question in and send and we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as we can as we go along through the evening. And just before we get started by asking Johnny some questions, we have a quick poll just to find out how many of you listening this evening are interested in perhaps going into a milk vending machine. So if you wouldn't mind, please selecting one of these choices. Are you thinking of installing a milk vending machine? Yes, no, or you've already got one, or you may have more than one. Okay, we're just waiting for the answers. Oh my goodness, this is really good. 84% of people listening are thinking of installing a milk vending machine. 12% already got one installed. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope you get some interesting questions coming out as well. And we'll do our best to help you through uh, Johnny's experiences. And I will point out that we are talking about Johnny's experience and that we always advise that you get proper independent advice from the relevant sources. So we'll just kick off with a really nice picture. This is uh, one of Johnny's cows. Johnny farms in Bungie, Suffolk. Not by too many dairy farmers in the area. And Johnny, if you just uh, introduce sort of the family farming partnership and um, how many farm staff and on the farm. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. Hi Shirley. Uh, we've uh, we, we are a family-run farm. Um, it's myself, my wife Dulcy. Uh, my mother and father are still very much part of the farm. They're now in their 70s. Um, on the farm today, uh, we have um, approximately uh, five people work around the farm, uh, either milking or crops or, you know, anything to do with the farm. Um, in total, there's around 30 people work, at, work in our business. That's including your cheese and processing. That's a big enterprise right. now, isn't it? Yeah. There's a lot of people around. Yeah. Can we move on a slide, please? Good. So we've covered the family partnership and the farm staff. And this is a really nice picture looking um, from the hill across the farm there. So we can see that lovely mist across the marshes. Just um, give us some idea of um, the uh, cropping and acreage you're covering. Um, so we've got around, I've had to write this down, Shirley, because I can't remember all these numbers, but we've okay. got around that. Um, we've got around 80 acres of uh, Italian rye grass and clover lays, uh, which yeah. we put into silage, 140 acres of maize silage a year, 25 acres of fodder beet, 50 acres of wheat, which all gets eaten by the cows in the winter months. Uh, we graze around 220 acres, um, that's 42 paddocks um, throughout the summer months. Um, the, the, the young stock um, and other silage bales and that kind of thing are um, come from another 300 acres on the farm. Um, this is all um, marshland, a bit prone to flooding. Uh, and then um, we've also, we own 140 acres, which, which we actually rent to other farmers, um, which are a little bit further away from our farm. Um, uh, and we've, we've recently purchased 60 acres um, of land, which we're putting into environmental stewardship schemes. Um, which is a, sort of a, a different sort of um, look, way of looking at farming. Um, 
but maybe that's a discussion for another night on that one. Yeah, okay, so just to tell us the turnout and housing, because you are practicing this rotational paddock grazing, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, so the cows go out as soon as we can, which for us is, if we're lucky, middle of March. The marshes do flood out the back where the cows graze. Um, we'll try and keep them out till um, as late as possible, usually the end of October, early November, it starts to get quite wet. Um, we've got two blocks, um, so uh, a lot, you know, several years back it was an all-round carving uh, herd, but now we're an autumn block carving and a spring block carving, and we choose to carve the blocks in the certain size we do at certain times we do, so it fits with our our, our milk to, uh, you know, to fit with production on the farm into cheese, butter, and you know, all all of the other things. So you're supplying your own level profile to yourself, aren't you? Yeah, it's sort of yeah. become that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we have a take a look at the cows before we get into breed, just give us um, herd size and sort of average yield at the moment. So the herd is around 300 animals. Um, it fits nicely with the size of farm we have. Um, the cows are yielding around 8,000 litres uh, of milk a year, butter fats, proteins um, on average around 4.1, 4.2. Butter fat, 3.5, 3.6 protein, um, and we've already discussed the carving patterns, haven't we? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, just mentioned breeding. Genetics have changed over the years, haven't they? It, it has. Yeah. So I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a in a short while. But um, we were our background is a Holstein herd uh, in the last sort of 20 years, but in the last 10 years that has switched. We've got three Holsteins now. Um, and the most, most, uh, the biggest percentage of our herd is Montbelliard, uh, with Montbelliard cross, and we do have some um, New Zealand Jersey um, in there as well to try and increase the butter fat in the spring. So that's kind of where we are at the moment with with um, breeds. Okay, so that's uh, given everybody an idea of where you're coming from and the farming system. If we move on to bottling milk now, just tell us what made you want to start selling milk to the direct to the public so um, i suppose this really goes back um you have to go back to the beginning um so so back in 2008 2009 uh me as a dairy farmer i, I was 28 29 years old at that time and i, I just got very, very frustrated i i, I kind of feel i like sometimes i'm a bit of a rebel and i didn't like the way dairy farmers were treated back then. I, I do I do think that this is a different, we're a different place now. But back then I just thought we were treated poorly. And on top of that, I didn't feel like, I think our herd had grown into a Holstein herd. I didn't really plan it that way, but it kind of happened because we were chasing liters of milk. And the more extreme the Holsteins got, the more things started going wrong for us. And uh, you know, like I say, looking back 2008, 2009, uh, we were pretty much uh, keeping our herd inside um, throughout the throughout the 12 months. And the grass out the back was really, it just was getting worse quality because nothing was grazing it. Um, and and I, I just didn't really like that system um, or the place we were at that time. I didn't like being um, told like where our milk price was going to be. Um, and and I think I went searching for other ideas, and I didn't really know at the time what we were going to end up doing. But um, what was interesting for me was free range hen farming, and I the more I sort of looked into it, the more I thought actually this could work with our farm that we've got all of these you know marshland, and maybe we could put some hen houses on there and have free range hens go out there, and it, it could work alongside the dairy. And uh, as we went out and visited um, these, you know, the obvious thing to do is if you're going to go into a new venture, you probably need to go and visit people who, mm. who, um, who, who do that. Um, so we, we went and visited free range hen farmers, mostly throughout East Anglia. There's quite a few in East Anglia. And, um, and it was interesting because as we started to understand the system and what you did more, it was there was a few of them, not all of them, but a few of them had this shed at the front of the of the farm, um, and very often near the road. Also interesting that the, these hen farmers, that the ones what had the sheds, were close to 
a, a town or a village or you know a reasonable population and um and as i stood there talking to the farmer about his hens i couldn't but notice the amount of cars that were coming into his drive pulling off somebody was getting out of the car going in getting a tray of eggs getting back in the car and going again and i asked him i i, I said um so just tell me a little bit about the um the, the shed your egg shed and he said well it's it, he said we just get all the seconds and the double yokers and you know all shapes and sizes we put them in there and we sell them for the same price as what a shop would sell them at and we just do it via an honesty box um and and i just thought oh, this is so simple it's, uh, i asked him how, how what, what sort of you know what do you take in a week and he said well we're surprising he said it all adds up it's about 500 pound cash a week and then i started thinking i thought so you know why are people going out of their way out of a, you know from a, you know they could buy the eggs in the supermarket with all their other groceries but they're choosing to come here why and and i asked him that and he said well uh, i guess it's because they like the connection with the farm they can see where the eggs come from that makes people feel better for that reason that they can see where their food has come from and also like he said you can't you know you notice the difference between eggs which have just been laid to eggs which have been several days um, you know, maybe weeks before they're they're actually um, eaten, and so people were responding to his little shed because they wanted to support a farmer, and 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 the eggs tasted good. And I said, "Do you, how does the theft side of it go?" And he said, "Well, actually, it's not too bad." He said, "This most people are honest," and I thought, "Hmm." So I went home and I kind of got a bit sort of like I, my mind started buzzing about actually maybe there's something in this maybe actually if if we as dairy farmers started selling our milk in the same way as the egg farm started selling his eggs then you know we could do the same and the question is why are not people doing this you know i couldn't recall seeing a a, a, a dairy farmer with a shed out the front selling his bottles of milk i'm sure it probably happened somewhere but i'd never seen one and so uh, me and my wife dulcie it, we, we didn't have anything to really lose. Um, we we bought this garden shed. Um, so the worst case is we were going to have a garden shed which didn't work, and we were going to put it in our garden and put things in it. Um, <laughs> okay. And so we, we we bought this garden shed. We painted it like a cow rather than a chicken, for obvious reasons, and stuck it stuck it near the road at our farm. Our farm is on the edge of the town, Bungie, and it's got a population of six thousand people. And uh, where we put the shed, it was straight on the edge of the road. Everybody could see it, and there's space beside it where you could park your car. And um, and we did this. Um, and um, and it, back in 2011, this is 2011 by the time we got to this point. And uh, and we we then um, we then looked at like selling milk. How do we go about selling milk? And uh, the more we looked into pasteurizing and that side of it, it kind of it does require quite a lot of money to to set yourself up. Selling raw milk is so simple; it just comes straight from the tank. And one of the other things <clears throat> at the time, <clears throat> you know, we we'd always drunk our milk raw, and whenever we bought milk, if we were on holiday or whatever, it always just didn't taste the same as your own milk. And we always had that in our mind that we've got a point of difference here. Mm. If we put the bottles in here, nobody else is selling raw milk. Nobody else is selling milk like I'm sure your grandfather would have said, uh, I used to pop down the farm and get my bottle of milk out of the tank and the cream was on the top. That was when you used to have lids in tanks and <laughs> you know, reminiscing of times of old. And, and, and so we did all of this. We set this shed up. We bought a poly, poly um, Pallet of poly bottles. We um, we 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 did we we made the bottle deliberately different. We didn't put a sticker on it, which you know the obvious thing is to look at what a bottle looks you know in the supermarket looks like with milk in it and try and copy it and do something like it because that's how milk is sold. We didn't do that. We did something completely opposite. And I don't know if you wanted to move on to the next slide Shirley. No I think um, what I'd like to ask you is that um, this sounds good but I know that you did contact the hygiene people first didn't you to see what it was yeah. you had to do. What yeah. kind of yes. hoops did you have to jump through? Okay yes yeah. so yes before we did any milk selling um, we 
you know, to do to you can't go renegade and start selling food without researching and making sure that you're selling uh, a, um, a you know a product which is is not going to make anyone ill or is illegal. Um, so raw milk, why are not people selling it in supermarkets? Is a good question. Um, so <clears throat> we contacted the Food Standards Agency at the time. They put us in touch with someone down in um, Devon, I think it was where it was being um, run from at the time. And um, and we went through the 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 the, the hoops of uh, selling raw milk legally. So um, at the time, it was pretty straightforward. It was just you had to pass two hygiene tests on your milk, and then you would have a license to sell raw milk. On top of that, we uh, we got in touch with our environment but environmental health officer, um, which was recommended by the Food Standards Agency to do so. This is all like new to me. I'd never come across this sort of like environmental health officers. All I knew of those were like people who go into restaurants and shut down people. So, um, so we got our environmental health officer over. He looked at what we were doing. Seemed quite fine with what we what we were up to. Um, the point of you know all the, the reason he's coming there is to just make sure you're producing something and taking the risk out of you know the product making somebody ill. Um, so we've gone through all of that. I think you said as well they were really helpful and it's better to get them on board from the start. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess we probably didn't realise it at the time, but 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 in hindsight, it's, you know, looking back at it, it's like one of the best things we did was bringing our environmental health officer on the journey with us. So before we did anything, including them in um, in what we were up to, so because it's no point getting to the making all the decisions without your environmental health officer, your EHO, um, and then inviting them out because they're going to tell you all of the things which um, which you which they don't like. So you then got to change them. So involving them from the beginning and getting them on your side, working together as a partnership is all they really want to do is, is make sure the product is safe. So, yeah. um, you know, and it, and it works very well. That's the whole point of them. So. Um, can we you know. just point out as well the TB issue because a lot of people in the West will have a different uh, status with TB compared to Suffolk. Yeah, so with raw milk, um, you can't sell raw milk if you've got TB in your herd. Um, there is a risk that you could make somebody ill. That's why it needs to be pasteurised. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, we can go on to like selling pasteurised milk as well. But you know, for us at this moment in time, we were we were look you know it was raw milk because of the, the the difference it had on milk yeah. in a supermarket. Um, okay. So, were there yeah. were there any legal things that you had to do other than the health and hygiene? You could actually sell raw milk from the roadside because it did go out of fashion at one point, didn't it? Yeah. So raw milk, I believe, was banned in 1982. It could be 1984, but it's around that time. Um, banned completely um, and then it was brought back in the late 1990s and um, it was brought back in a kind of strange way that it was rather than looking as as the product was safe to drink and it could be sold anywhere anywhere it came back as a sort of restricted sales to restrict sales so difficult that you can't get a hold of it because it because it's dangerous so it was looked at. It was more looked at. Just, ex, just, just, you know, assume it's dangerous. So let's try and restrict sales, which mm -hmm. kind of is the really the wrong way about go, going about this. Um, but it came back in the late 1990s, and it's very, very small, low key, it, you know, um, sales of raw milk throughout the sort of early 2000s. Um, and but it started to gain a little bit of momentum in the late 2000s, and then into the into the into the um, you know the 20, 2010 and, and on. I understand the restriction is it has to be sold from the farm. Yeah, restrictions are um, has to be sold from the farm gate mm. or by a milk roundsman. Okay. You can sell it direct by your website. Um, so your milk roundsman is the distributor between you and your end customer. Um, it's w weird set of rules, but that's that's what how it stands at the moment. Okay, and um, just before we move on to the fridge, um, 
who filled the bottles of milk when you first started and how long did it take you? So um, we, we just just invented this stuff as we went, but we, we literally just got a, our stainless steel welder guy down the road to weld a smaller, he, he drilled the end of the bulk tank where you've got the flat sort of the bit which, you know, not, there is no tap on it or anything. We just drilled a hole through that, uh, welded a little piece of pipe, uh, put a piece of silicon on the end, one of those little like snap um, clip things on the silicon pipe and just literally got a, a, a load of milk crates and sat the bottles in the milk crates and filled them straight um, into the into the bottle from the bulk tank. Um, it was that simple. Um, okay. And um, and uh, you know obviously it, it's got to be refrigerated, kept below four degrees. I mean we've learned so much since we started doing that, but um, but that's that's how we started out. Okay. We've just had a quick question about um, TB and a neighbour having um, an outbreak and selling raw milk and I think that kind of thing really is something that you need to go to the authorities about um, because that kind of thing is very specialised advice. Johnny obviously is operating out of Suffolk which is still on a four-year TB testing. Correct but you do if you go into selling raw milk or any raw dairy product you will um, have to do a, a yearly TB test. I don't okay. think that's a bad thing by the way I think that's actually a yeah. good thing. Okay, um, so we just have a look moving on to your fridge because we can see the first one that you did and all these lovely bottles. How long would it take you to fill how many bottles? Uh, I would fill those bottles up in, I mean, this was like literally in the first two or three days, I think. Um, mm -hmm. These bottles would be filled up in about 20 minutes. Um, okay. And if you're careful and you didn't spill any milk over the tops of the bottles, you could then, you wouldn't have to wipe them down or clean them. We then, yeah. we then spent, I mean, really at the beginning, it was literally our old Olivetti um, printer. We printed out all of those stickers, bought yeah. um, luggage tags off Amazon and uh, stuck them on by hand and tied the luggage tag to the bowl. Um, and, um, and that's how it started out. But it was just seeing those bottles and that big, thick line of cream, um, you know, they, they, they do look very attractive to the to the customers. And how much were you selling them for? Kept it simple, a pound a litre, two pound, mm -hmm. two litres. Uh, you know, when you're looking at honesty box, keeping change, the simpler, the better. Um, you know, this is going back 10 years now and, um, you know, card machines and things like that, you know, not so sort of prominent at that time. So everything was cash. And you can yeah. see just on the left hand side of the screen, there's a black box. That yeah. was our that was our our tin. It just had a hole in it, and it was bolted to the to the shelf. Okay. Um, so and how simple. can you remember how many bottles you might have sold in in a week back in those days? In, in August 2011, the first day we put 30 bottles in, and we sold all 30. So the next day I put 35, and then I sold them too, and then on it went. I mean, it it it, it got to within a month or two, we were selling 60, 70 liters um, a day. Um, it, it was sort of we left a comments book, which is always a really good thing, because you you want to understand when people enjoyed their t time in the shed. But equally, hopefully, people will write things of constructive sort of criticism and things in, mm -hmm. in that book. So we learned from our customers what they liked. Um, we didn't take every idea what people said. You know, some some of them were silly, but yeah, you, you can learn a lot from your customers through that. But okay. um, but look, but my point was that they were writing in the book how amazing the milk tasted they can't believe milk tasted this good mm. um and and then we get kept getting returning customers um and and on it went that's really good um oh we've got another question um are you required to test for salmonella yes so um if you i mean raw milk rules have changed since then but um regardless it's um, important to test for all of the sort of pathogens which you would find in milk so that'd be salmonella, compilobacter, E. coli and listeria um, so uh, and staph aureus so you, you need to be testing for all of those um, when you go into selling raw milk um, or any milk you know if you're pasteurizing you should be testing more frequent, frequently at the beginning till you start to have a good track record once you've got that record and you can see, you know, things are stable. 
um, then you can reduce your testing. But bear in mind the seasons change, so don't think just because I tested everything and it was okay in, in July that come grotty winter it's going to be okay. So it's important just to bear that in mind too. You've got to be squeaky clean. Another question is: Were you milking Holsteins at this stage? Were they still housed? Yes. So at this stage, we were milking Holsteins. Uh, we were playing around with a little bit of crossbreeding with Brand Swiss, but it was it was virtually all Holstein. The cows were um, were were still mostly um, in sheds. We um, at this stage again. This goes back to um, when I joined our, my discussion group uh, with um, Shirley here, and um, and actually. There's more things happening happening at this moment in time. It's not only is the shed going off, but um, I'm going out for the first time in my life and seeing some um, some other dairy farms which you don't see many in East Anglia, and that sort of inspired us to 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 go into more um, block carving and certainly at the, this point um, autumn carving, which suited our herd. Probably it probably does still suit our herd best to be autumn carving. OK, and so in terms of public perception, your cows obviously are now grazing a lot longer, aren't they? Um, Ten months of the year sometimes. What's the public perception of that? I think it's good. I mean, that's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, the cows were very happy before they were more gra grazing animals, but I think it's the public do, there's no way of getting around it, they do like to see cows in fields. But yeah. it was my preference. It was our, it, you know, our farmers is, is is there. It's it's been put there for the marshes, the fields around it. It's a, it's really a grazing, um, a grazing herd farm. So really, we were just not farming it the way it should be farmed. So once I understood more about like how to graze correctly and started to realise actually you don't have to have a Holstein. You know, everybody around us in, in our area had Holstein, so why wouldn't we too? But once you actually go a bit further afield and start visiting other farmers, um, you know, that's 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 why we, you know, it's not just a, sh a shed why we change things, there's other things going on at this point in time. So you're selling your whole farm really, aren't you? Sorry, Shirley? You're selling your whole farm really to the public, this is how we do things here. Yeah, well, I just, I just, I thought that was why were people were coming back because they were responding to quality just as the egg farmer did. They were coming back. They like buying it from farm and it tasted better. So if that's if that's you know if that's why people keep coming back, then therefore we should really do more of that. So we should instead of looking at quantity of milk and how to get more milk from a cow and more cows, we should be looking at how we make that milk which comes from that cow taste better and that's okay. what we've been doing ever since. Okay, um, if we move on to sort of uh, cover some of the next steps because um, you were selling a lot of milk, you were filling up the bottles, I believe at one point you might have had a Saturday boy to help with filling up the milk bottles, um, there was all the testing going on so what led you into a vending machine? It, it, the re vending machine came about through um, I guess it so going back to the story so we we had we were doing very well for a few months but because we were doing very well it attracted the wrong kind of person too and um, and unfortunately we, we started to get theft so people were coming not the money they couldn't get that without a big saw um, but the, the bottles of milk and and we uh, we the, the obvious thing is to put CCTV on which we did and we caught these um, people stealing the milk, um, you know, within a day of putting the CCTV in. We we took stills of these people and um, we put them up on the front of the shed and wrote thieves in three different languages just to be on the safe side. They understood who they were, um, and they went away. But it kept the thieving kept happening, and uh, you just couldn't control. The, the, the people putting a coin in the box. You didn't know whether it was a 1p or a pound, and it just wasn't working. So, but, but, but because it was so enjoyable doing it, um, I just didn't want to be beaten by these people. So we looked, the obvious thing is to put milk into a bottle and put it into a vending machine, just like you'd find Coca-Cola or um, 
chocolate bars, that kind of thing. Um, so we started researching, looking at these machines, and I think it was it was Dolphy's, um, one of Dolphy's friends, when she was talking to him about it, um, that he said, oh, look, I'll send you a link of this, this vending machine, like milk dispenser machine in Italy. And um, we found it, we looked at the website, and it's like these big machines with tanks what go inside, where customers can come and fill their bottles up. And, uh, and we thought, this just makes total sense. This is a moment in time where people are trying to get away from plastic. And that th this system is so simple, like people are go going back to the old days where they go to the farm with a bottle, their glass bottle, fill it up and, and have their fresh milk for the day, just like that one. Um, and, uh, and so the next thing is we got on a plane to Italy and went to uh, the company called DF Italia and, um, and spoke to them um, and, uh, and, and bought this vending machine. Um, and uh, brought it back to the UK. Very scary, sort of like um, buying a big bit of kit for several thousand pound with with no one tried and tested in the UK. Um, and um, we set it up. Uh, and within a few weeks, we had a, a few initial sort of people really annoyed that they just can't get their milk very quickly and easily. But actually, people did did love it. And and that created um, an interesting story for newspapers and 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 TV. Um, it was so quite a novelty, was wasn't it? And I do remember you had a um, a help service because I had to use it. Press the button and somebody came running. I think it was your brother showing me how to actually fill up the bottle and put the money in. Yeah. So that was really good customer service. I think it was the novelty factor, wasn't it? Going in there with your bottle. It, it was. It was just something different, and no one had probably seen it before um yeah. and and it, and it just just got more interest and and milk sales went up further 100 liters a day 150 liters a day 200 liters a day um i mean right now it sits around 200 and that's it's you know we found our our, our plateau um but uh but it's it, it you know it's maintained that and this is now 10 years on okay so in terms of cost how much did it cost and how quickly could you pay that back pay back that cost so the original one was around six seven thousand pounds we've since gone on to put a more um expensive one in which was around eleven thousand at the time but the original one um yeah it, it it's it, it was that it was that cost but when you look at your cost of your you know just keeping numbers simple if you had a pound a litre so your bottle has cost you one litre, the bottle has cost you, uh, with the top and the label, about 18p. Then there's the, the, the cost of putting milk in a tank and cleaning a tank. Um, and, and then there's the cost of what you would sell it to a big milk processor. Um, so putting that all together, you're looking at 50, 60p. Um, and so it leaves you with 40. So, so it does, if you're set up right, then it does, it does make a good, good margin. But you will probably find it, it you know you're not going to keep selling all your milk through it you will come to a level depending mm -hmm. on the location you've got it, it you know you 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 know i don't i don't know the sort of biggest milk seller through a vending machine anymore but but you'll probably you know three four hundred liters a day is it, you it's know tops. Five, yeah yeah okay so we've got a couple of yeah. Can you sell milk direct from the farm to a local farm shop which has a vending machine? If it's pasteurised, yes. Yeah. But not okay. small. If you're pasteurised, you can sell it anywhere. And with the glass bottles, so if people are bringing their own glass bottles, are they sterilised? They, they, the, the, the best you can do is put on the bottle. You, you need to sterilise this bottle. You can give advice on how you sterilise it, but yeah. that is that is as much as you can you as much as far as you can go but you know you could argue you know like when you buy anything you don't say on the packet you know you've got, got to do this or you're going to die you know you just assume people use common sense with some things okay and are you still selling the bottles yourself so that somebody can buy a bottle to fill up yeah yeah so we 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 sell the bottle um interesting the bottle thing because we we started selling them um, at a two pound a litre, uh, sorry, two pound a one litre glass bottle. 
And then we trialed a, uh, a period of time where we gave people the glass bottle for free, hoping that we could remove plastic from our shed um, altogether. Um, but sadly, um, people just kept taking the glass and, uh, you know, it, it didn't make sense. So we've gone back to, to, to still leaving plastic bottles in the shop for people to use. But if you are going to be a regular customer, we encourage people to buy the glass bottle. Um, so because it takes, I think there's, it's about seven plastic litres to have the same environmental impact on one glass bottle. So, um, so uh, yeah, I, I would offer both but encourage people to come back with their glass bottle. Okay, and in terms of um, advertising, how did you go about promoting this vending we, machine? We just put signs up, um, and um, and one of the things what we, we learned in the early days is like, make sure your signs look good because they say everything about your business. So the first, you, you know, put the signs in spots where, you know, before there's a turning or, you know, encourage people to turn off so some of our signs won't have the miles written on them they'll just say turn right here but once they've turned right and they're committed on the smaller road we'll say four miles you know ah, okay you know, but it's it, it, putting signs up is 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 really good um but just make sure your signs are good don't do not do any like you know writing on the on the on the sign especially if you run out of space at the end and have to write the last two letters small you know it to, to you know picture yourself if you were the person who might buy your raw milk or your milk and you come across you know you you're you're, you're probably doing it with a burger van or something or you, you know you'll come across the sign that says fast food or hot food or coffee or something and you look at it and think i might die if i eat this and so you drive on, but then mm. you come across the, the, the shiny Starbucks sign or the McDonald's sign. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan of either, but that that th it shows professionalism and 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 like, okay, if I have this, I know what it's going to taste like. I'm not going to die from it. It's not expensive or what, whatever you, was going through your mind at the time. So you pull over. So make sure your you, you know your sign what you put up is the style of sign what you put up is is going to be the thing which the type of customer what you expect to have at your shop make sure that sign um is designed to to appeal to that person yeah if we move on to look at another picture of one of your sheds because i think you upgraded sheds didn't you um we've yeah. got a picture of the bigger one and so the vending it's, machine was installed in this that, yeah, that is the original one, Shirley. So that oh, is, that's the original shed, yeah. So that um, that was shut off in the evening. Um, yeah. And now it's actually open 24-7. It never shuts. Um, okay. But uh, it's just sit, sitting next to the tank room. And behind mm -hmm. it, you might see a little, if you're a dairy farmer, you'll notice the colour of the concrete. You'll know that the cows stand there. Yeah. Um, so, ah, um, so that's it, another selling point. The, the, the customers can see the cows. Yeah, absolutely. They love seeing, you know, if you, you, you're not come up, come to a farm regularly. I mean, for us as dairy farmers, it's like, well, it's like cows everywhere and you just get used to them. But, you know, for most people having that sort of be able to see or touch a cow, it's, it's really, it's one of the reasons they come to the farm. Mm, that's really good. Um, if we move on a slide, um, this is a current machine. Yeah. yeah that's your, your first machine, I believe, has got a special home. Um, yeah, it actually ended up in the uh, the, uh, the Victoria V and A, isn't it, museum in London? So yeah. it went as a, um, as an art piece to a um, an exhibition a couple of years back there. So that was really that was really That's pretty good. special. We got an invite to to go and to go and see it. Yeah. So um, how many different vending machines have you had since the first one? Um, so just two. So okay. um, so but this one has been going on and on um and you know i changed several broom handles and several brooms um but you know it, there's been a few bits on it changed over the years but it's still the same machine okay uh, um still italian yeah yeah and um, what, what about payment to... now sorry shirley what about payment now so so um you know obviously times have changed dramatically in the last 
year and a half and um and we were already starting to look at card readers before then but um the beauty about the card reader especially if you start as you mean to go on with card readers because people don't like change so start the machine with a card reader and um you, you know there's, there's little risk of people coming in and stealing money and breaking the machine there's nothing in it apart from milk so uh you know it, it there's you know there's little risk of having to lock your shed up and uh, it, you know so you can leave it open all the time really mm -hmm. um okay. but uh but yeah we, we've got now card readers on all of the vending machines <clears throat> okay um just briefly um what did this raw milk sales lead into in terms of further processing well um off the back of the success of the, the shed and the selling the raw milk um it you know the more i thought about it the more i thought well what else can we use our milk to add value to and um and that led us on to really what sort of the, the biggest part of our farm now is our cheese so um so uh, i mean again i could probably be here for an, an hour just talking about cheese but i'll, I'll probably keep it short but uh, we, we we did a similar sort of thing we visited farmers around the uk who were making um you know cheese um especially raw milk cheese and um, started to learn and understand what they did. And then we, we found this, the, 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 the niche in the market, which was unpasteurized brie. And then we set our, our you know, we, we then focused totally on making that one cheese and, and built a, 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 a design and built a, a, a cheese making um, building on the farm. And um, with the idea in, uh, in the early days of like selling it in our shed. So, um we 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 have and we you know at the time we bought this second vending machine which is a bit more straightforward and what you would kind of see in the uk um at train stations and hospitals where there's an item in it and you can open the door and get get the product out but we had the idea of making cheese selling in our little shop selling at farmer market farmers markets but you know like anything you start off small and then you 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 you, you see something what works and you push a little bit more and do something else and it leads you down this road so um it was really the raw milk which led us down this this new this new direction we've gone in whole new direction if we um, move on to your next slide we might be able to see um the the shed and so you've got a better idea of how these vending machines look and you're also offering coffee yeah so just one thing one idea led to the next you, you know started off with raw milk um this is obviously shed number two here it's bigger um and since since the original shed you notice the the, the design the logo and the and the font the signs and everything is looking much more professional now um so you know all part it's all part of the image of the of the farm um you, you also stand here looking at this shed from the road apart from like me um leaning on that sign there if it just from the picture i wasn't there you're going to see a, a clean clean shed flowers out the front uh posh signs shiny things inside it's enough to make someone feel like comfortable to pull in and check it out a little bit further once we got them in there it's like the old spider's web isn't it so um you've got them yeah you're, you're trapped you could you know you can't resist buying a piece of cheese or a bottle of milk but, but it, it just really led from one thing to the next so the raw milk started off then we bought the machine beside it which we then put our cheese and then we started selling eggs and and um you, you know uh, the glass bottles went in there um the eggs weren't by the way from our farm but a, a good friend of ours down the road who makes really amazing egg, uh, his hens um, laying really amazing eggs and then and then the then the, the the sort of the next thing seemed like well there's not really you know you see all those costs of um express machine vending machine things everywhere and you think well what about if we just did something like that that actually used really good beans and our milk and um and lo and behold you put two good ingredients together and you get a really good coffee um so we put we put um a vending machine in there and we catch loads of people going to work in the mornings getting their espressos and but it's not it, it complements the other things so that the raw the, the raw milk complements the coffee the coffee complements the raw milk um ideally they'll see the cheese and they'll get their coffee from the morning but they'll get a bit of cheese for lunch 
and on it goes. Um, That's good. We, we've got another um, question. How many times a day do you have to fill the vending machine and what time of day do you fill it? So everybody will be doing things slightly different, but what, we, what works for us is um, we, uh, we have three tanks. So in that vending machine, there's three 200 litre tanks and we, uh, we always have a clean one ready. So in, in, early in the morning, the first job, when we start milking the cows, the first line of cows will come through the parlour, fill that tank. So then that tank um, is then wheeled into a chiller, which is beside that shed. Um, and that stays there till I, I change the barrel. So that's my job in the morning. Around about 5.30, 6 o'clock, I will wheel the new barrel out of the chiller, which is just fresh milk, take the old barrel back, um, which is only 24 hours old. So if there's any milk left in the bottom, I take that back and then we'll either put that into a cheese or back into the tank uh, where it gets sold on or, uh, you know, so you, so the milk is never old. It's just, we're always continuously keeping it fresh. So the question is if you sell all 200 liters, you know, that's where the third barrel come in. So I'm always ready for like spikes of the year, busy periods. I can then always move into the third. And the other good thing is if you break, one of the barrels break, you've always got a backup. One yeah. thing what you, what you don't want to do is have customers come to your shop and then the machine's not working because it's just, it's just, just chaos. People, people get really angry. They've driven miles to get the milk and there's no way you can't tell them the machine's broken because you don't know who they are. But just try your hardest to avoid your machines breaking. Mm. I think that's really important. Another question is um, how often, um, uh, so how, how much are the glass bottles to buy? Uh, depends which ones you get, but I think the sort of bog standard just round glass bottle is around 30, 40, 45p. It might have gone off recently. Um, if you want them printed, it then becomes double, um, but the bottle does look really posh. Um, the ones that we get are um, actually we, we we get we have square bottle, so they cost more still. We don't actually make anything on the bottle, but because it looks really nice, um, you know, we want people to reuse it. It doesn't matter to us so much. The saving is by not putting plastic away. Yes. Yeah. The same. Um, have you have you thought of doing milkshakes? Um, we 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 have. I, I think it's it, you know you know like anything. Where do you draw the line with this? um we um we 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 well right now i think it, for us it's you know there's five machines in that shed i don't think there's room for another one um this is okay. the idea of the ice cream as well you know um both both can be big successes um okay. so yeah but yeah it's a good idea another question in your opinion is it best to have your point of sale at the roadside or next to the dairy uh yeah that's a good one ideally both um i think it's better to have it near the roadside than the dairy if your dairy's down the, the drive um you're going to have a lot of people come down your drive they're going to get in the way it, unless you've got you know if you've got farm machinery those kind of things coming off the drive not so good you, you've just got to um you've just got to bring some of the farm to the shed so, you know, nice pictures in the, in the shed of the farm, the cows and, and the people, the people on the farm, you know, people want to see that. They want to see real families, real, you know, everything wants to show off a real farm. Don't, you know, that's why people are coming. So, so try and try your best to get the shed looking, get as much in it about the farm as possible. And ideally you'd put it where there's a field where there'd be at least some young stock or something grazing. Mm. Um, so, um, but but it, it's convenience more than anything. Um, that's the key. It, it's it's about being able to stop quickly and get your bottle of milk and keep going. Everyone will come down the farmyard once, um, but but really it's it's when people are in a hurry they they get fed up with seeing cows. They just want to get their milk and go home. They that yeah. needs to be the road. Did it lead to an open farm Sunday for you? Have you ventured down that road yet? No, we, we've got a really successful open farm, Sunday farm just down the road from us. So what I do is I take a little bit of what we do to that farm and, okay. and or I, I just, um, because they do such a good job, it, 
I just didn't think it would um, it'd be right to, you know, uh, seem to make more sense joining up. Join that one. Okay, so our next slide, I did want to ask, uh, we've talked about how it's gone and grown and developed. So for you, what were the mistakes or hard lessons? Um, mistakes. You've you've got to um you've got to be you've got to make your shop. Um, you've got to think about all of the things what are going to go wrong with your customers. So so people don't read signs or instructions. So how do you get over that? It's really difficult. So you know vending machines they people will get them wrong. So just try your hardest to put instructions on there which are really 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 obvious so you, you know you try trial it with uh, you know a child to see if they read the instructions would they get the vending machine right and um and and if that all works put your put your signs up there um you you've got to be careful the amount of time it may pull out of your day if if you if your shed is not set up right and things go wrong with it you're back and forth um you're back and forth to that shed um, quite a lot, so be be aware of that. Um, what would be a I time do? Time drainer, couldn't it? Sorry, yeah, it, it yeah, be yeah, careful. Be time it's drainer. It takes, you know, there's nothing worse than starting a job and having to keep stopping it. You know, say for instance, you're, I don't know, doing something around the back on the farm, and and you have to keep stopping and going up to the shed. It it drives you crazy. Um, you've got you've got to keep you've got to be really polite to your customers. And I would always give the customers something free. Then I would um, have an argument with them. They're, they're they're always going to be right for us. Mm. Um, you know, you, you you've got to. They, they've got to like you. Um, if they don't to like you, they'll tell, tell everyone. They t they'll tell everyone that they don't they don't like you. Um, so just be aware of that. Don't be a grumpy farmer. Um, okay. And talking um, about the timing. Up. We've got a question that says, when when you're in the middle of carving, does it become a, a challenge to keep the vending machine filled? Um, for us, it's okay because we've got two blocks, so there's always milk. Um, if you had a single block and you were tight tight carving block, then that will be challenging. That's something I haven't really thought about, but it might be a period of time where you don't get milk. But I, I think it, you just you know most people are actually quite happy. As long as they know, so you just make sure there's a sign up there saying well in advance that you know because of the season of the cows and the way the farm works, there won't be any milk between you know whatever date till February or whatever. Um, and people are okay with that. Um, yeah. There's nothing else you can do. I mean, it's still better to do that than buy in milk which is not your milk, and you're trying to you're you're kind of like not telling them the truth. Then people people will see through that. Okay, so um, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently starting again? Um, I would have a bigger car park, um, and um, at, people want want a car park where they can drive in and drive out easy. Um, uh, I I mean, what would I do now? I'd pro I would probably put a, a big shop up down the road away from the farm. Because right now it's so many cars and lorries and things come on the farm. It's you know it's for us it's it, it is potentially the shop is it does get in the way of, of the farm, but but it does it is such an important part of our story and and quirkiness to the farm. So um, yeah, what well, I I don't think I would do anything anything differently other than that. I'd have a bigger car park. It's mm -hmm. It works. The shed works fantastically, and and it's incredibly enjoying and enjoyable and satisfying having customers come to your shop and buy your produce and go away happy. Um, that makes that makes it does, it's surprising. I, I one of the first things I noticed when we first started selling raw milk um, or any produce, what you what you make on the farm, all of a sudden there's something what clicks, and you think, hang on a minute, look. I've done everything here. I've done everything right from the soil to the crop to the animal to the product, and someone's buying it from me, and that feels really good. Um, and so, so I, yeah, for me, it, it, it's made me a much happier person. 
That's really good. Um, I suppose it is important for anybody listening that they think about future proofing the site, like with any farm building, you think about uh, success and what it looks like. Have you got enough room for a bigger vending machine or more cars? That's going to be really important. Absolutely. And, and one of the other things, what, you know, what I've seen with other farmers who have gone on to, um, you know, start off with a selling raw milk or, or pasteurized milk through a vending machine is that it's actually led to other things. So it's a great sort of like introduction to diversification on your farm. And uh, at, because you, you learn a lot from that and then you start to understand like where you go next. So we went down the processing week, the production of other products on the farm with our with our milk but i've seen farmers who've gone to bigger farm shops or maybe making ice cream or you know so it it's just a it's a great you know if you're interested in adding value to the products you make it's a really good starting point um and you, you know you learn a little from 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 the vending machine and then and then before you know it i i will guarantee this if you do this well if you do your vending machine well there will be people phone you up and say um I've got a little coffee shop down the road. I'd love to have your milk in my sh my shop. Or have you thought about like um, you know making yogurt? And oh, I'd love to have your yogurt. Or you know, and, and on it goes, and uh, and 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 it just builds. It you know, people spread the word. It's really good. We've got another question. How much of your day would you say is taken up by the vending machine? Filling it, washing, keeping it clean. Um. It would take 15 minutes to clean it, 15 minutes to fill it, but that's part of milking anyway. Um, 15 minutes to change the barrel. But then for us with our shop, it takes two hours every day to, to do all of those things and clean it down and restock all of the cheeses and things. Um, but, you know, it's now, you know, turning over, you know, tens of thousands of pounds every year. Um, and you know, so it, 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 you know, it requires a certain amount of time. You, you know, you can't have everything without doing anything, but, yeah. um, if you just did raw milk or just pasteurized milk, actually that part is quite quick. And the pasteurizing side of it is a bit slower. That's, that will take a bit more time there, okay. more things to clean. And we mentioned about being clean with your milk. What extras are you having to do in terms of milking time for cows? So with raw milk, uh, you do need to go a, 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 another level of cleaning cows' teats and, and having a healthy cows. So, um, so the way we, we take raw milk um, at the moment is we, we, we have the first line of cows come in the parlour. Uh, the reason we choose the first line is because they're generally the most fittest and healthiest and, um, and the parlour is at its cleanest, the filter sock is at its cleanest, and the guys who are milking are at their sort of fittest. So you're, you know, as the milking goes on, you know, we're all the same. You start to get tired at the end of it and you get the awkward cow at the end, don't you? So you don't want no awkward cow what's gonna spoil it. So, um, so milk at the beginning of the milking and it goes straight into the vending tank from the parlor. It doesn't go into a bulk tank because a bulk tank's one more thing what can go wrong. So, um, so you know, all of the obvious things have got to be checked, like temperature of water, chemical dosage, um, you know, cleanliness of the milking parlour, health of the cow, stripping the cow's water, making sure milk is not no infection or anything like that in there. It's, 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 you know, you've got to be at the top of your game for raw milk. Mm. Okay, that's really good. Um, and we just need to move on to our final slide. Just give us a quick overview at the moment that we talked about you've gone into cheese and things but you've got your own website you've set up a cheese club for your customers yeah yes yeah, so we've got um what you know we've gone on to obviously our website we've got um subscri subscription subscription cheese boxes going out um we have about um 750 subscription boxes going out um every quarter now with our, our cheese you can buy any of our products on our website um markets we do a yeah, few markets you're going to you well, no what i meant was you were going overseas weren't you with your cheese yeah it goes everywhere i mean we've got like michelin star restaurants in singapore using it um the japanese love the butter um yeah. 
you know, it's just uh, it's in the Middle East. I don't know. I lose track of where it gets to now. Okay. Um, and but, and there's always for anybody listening, there is a raw milk producers organisation now. Yeah. So one of the things myself and a few more raw milk producers, we came came together and set up an association for for raw milk producers to come to for help and advice. Um, and, and it's just a way of people coming together, um, a membership where we can be stronger as, uh, as a collective of people. So it's called the Raw Milk Producers Association. And um, if you sell raw milk or are interested in it, then do get in touch. Um, it's sort of a, a wealth of knowledge on, on producing raw milk and, um, and everybody who's a member of uh, all, you know, really helpful and happy to give advice um so um uh it, yeah, it's I just a way of, yeah keeping we keeping can send people there. a link to that after this um what, what's next for you in terms of milk sales and processing do you think um for us it's it's um really continuing what we're doing now I, i'm very happy with with um we, we make um, cheese the baron by god brie um butter we make skier yogurt which is the skim milk part of the of the of the milk which goes to butter and we sell our raw milk. Um, again, our, the, our herd is 300 cows, and it's the size of the farm. So, you know, we, we've only we've got a sort of a size what we can go to. But it's about you, you know, it's about people understanding your brand and your values and what you, you know what what do you mean to them? And pe to us, to, to people, we mean a, a real dairy farm selling, making and selling products from that farm. So all of that needs to be thought through um but uh if anything i'd like to have a little bit more time off and go on holiday <laughs> that's probably um that's what i would like to do a little bit more the last 10 years has been incredibly um hard, incredibly hard work so um yeah trying to enjoy enjoy it um a little bit of time away from the farm would be nice I think that's a really good note to finish on. So thank you very much, Johnny, for giving up your time this evening. It's a really great story to tell. I think you've given everybody lots of good facts and your own personal experience. And if we look at what's next uh, from AHDB, then um, we can say, if you are a Dairy Pro member listening to this, if you type your name and farm name and membership number into the questions box, you can register for your CPD points. If you want to um, keep in touch, you can go to our website and fill out the form where we'll be able to keep you up to date with future invites for meetings and webinars and podcasts. But also there's all kinds of tools and business resources, all the other webinar recordings on the AHDB dairy web page we will be launching a machine a vending machine web page later this summer so if you are on this uh, webinar we'll contact you directly and you can follow us on facebook or twitter and i did forget to put them up there but that's me i'm not on social media but i'm sure you'll be able to find us if you're there so i would just like to thank you all very much for taking your time to join us this evening uh, for taking part and thanks for your attention and uh, we'll um, see you again at another webinar. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Goodbye.